So yes, today's uh, informal RPG chat, we're just going to talk a little bit about ecosystems and what they mean in old school games. Um, and while I'm installing YED, um, oops. While I'm installing YED, um, I want to just give you guys a quick rundown of what happened in my playthrough of the Maze of the Blue Medusa on, uh, on Friday night. So, um, because that's relevant to, to the current situation. So, I had my players start. Uh, basically, they had, they had hired on as guards for a paranoid nobleman in a town. Um, one, of his, um, one, of, one of his manservants had gone missing just recently, but just before going missing, his manservant had, had been inquiring aggressively about a new painting that the nobleman had acquired. Let's see, why Ed Graph Editor. There. Um, so yes, this new painting that... Um, okay. Um, Yes, so uh, the, the servant had been inquiring about this painting, and this made the nobleman very nervous, especially in the face of, um, in the face of his su sudden disappearance. So he hired the players to guard his estate from the thieving that he was expecting to come. So they all set up, and, and they spent maybe an hour or two even, just like getting into the game and figuring out like you know what their character sheets and how they knew each other and uh, who had the letter of reference to recommend them to Humphrey Bostock, the nobleman. Um, and they started setting up very seriously. They, they set two people guarding the painting in the parlor. They set uh, one person in the library and one person in the bedroom areas upstairs. And then there was another four adventurers who had also um, responded to the ad and they placed themselves outside uh, one at each entrance. There was a front entrance, a rear entrance, and a servant's entrance. And then um, one person sort of rotating around the house. So they got all that set up. And then, of course, um, well, they saw the painting moving. And a bunch of them were like, oh, we shouldn't touch the painting. We should just, we should stay here and guard it. That's what we've been hired to do. We're going to get 60 silver pieces if we, if we guard this painting for a month. And I was like, you're an NPC, not a player character. <laughs> so like, as an aside, if you're playing an adventure game, make choices for your character that pushes you into adventures, as opposed to choices for your character that would mean that you're just an NPC who never earns experience. Because you're a player character, you want to go into crazy dungeons and find gold and earn experience and face down terrifying monsters. So eventually they touch the painting and they go inside and they find the woman who's chained up, Chanterelle, uh, and they negotiate with her for a long time before finally she gets them to, to, to break open her chains. So they break open her chains and they open the door to the north and they meet um, Lady Cruchem Capelli, Capelli. The, the dragon woman, six foot two, dark blue skin, curling ivory horns on her head, huge wings draped off of her back. Um, and she, of course, is saying, oh, you know, it would be a shame to destroy this place. There's such great art here. Um, oh, hey, listen, I'm trying to preserve as much as I can. Will you bring things back to me to preserve them? So this is like point one where the players start engaging an ecosystem is the very first encounter that they have on accessing the maze. They meet a woman who, oh wow, Quacklad just resubscribed for nine months in a row. Thank you very much, Quacklad. Welcome back to GM Chat. Yes, the first, the first encounter that they have in the maze is, is with a woman who is, has relation to the rest of the maze. And she gives them a reason to go investigate further because she's willing to pay for any goods that they bring back to her from within the maze. So, while all of this is going on, one of them looks in the painting behind them that they came through.
Yeah, uh, well, well, they look behind them at the painting they came through, and there's a, a small child that has appeared in the painting. So they go back through, they talk to the child, and it's this, it's this ghost child, um, uh, uh, sort of a phantom, a specter, and it's communicating to them through pantomime which is also awesome because all of a sudden it means that I as a GM can't just tell them what's happening. I have to like either describe what this child is trying to like how he's trying to move it or just pantomime myself, which is a lot of fun. But this child is the child of one of the liches that's in the dungeon and he's offering the players his hand. And if the players grab his hand, then he can teleport the players to another part of the dungeon. Um, and, and what he wants, and, and all of these NPCs have, um, have wants and diswants. So, like, uh, um, the, the, the child, Tycho Wart, he wants to uh, save his mother, the Lich, who's, who's deeper in the dungeon. So knowing that already gives me a way to use this character in an interesting way. So... Um, so he, he was like beckoning to the players to hold hands together and to grab his hand, and nobody was really buying it until I rolled a random encounter that was actually one of the deadliest random encounters on the charts. And I was like, oh shit, you hear like heavy th thumping footsteps and squeaking noises from outside in the hallway. And, um, and finally they, they all grabbed hands, they grabbed the, the ghost boy's hand and they all teleported fairly close by, but he pulled them through time and space over to a room that was uh, semi-adjacent. They exit out of the room, and um, and they're in a, like a coat closet that has like all sorts of like rotten food all over the place. It's got coats hanging down everywhere, and there's a um, there's a peacock, a mechanical peacock sitting there. And again, this mechanical peacock is related via the ecosystem of the dungeon to the rest of the dungeon. So the child is trying to lead the players through the dungeon to where his mother is because they want, he wants the, the players to save his mother. Um, the, the mechanical peacock is some sort of a, sort of a, a guard or a butler for the wedding that was taking place hundreds of years ago in this section of the dungeon. And um, so when the players come out, this peacock starts inquiring whether or not they have uh, an invitation to the wedding. And the players don't really know whether this peacock is a threat or not, so they're trying to deal with him very carefully and cautiously. Like, uh, do you have an invitation? Like, you know, yeah, of course, they try to, like, bluff. We, we, know, um, we know the bride or the groom, Gravcall, and he was like, that's not his name. So there was just, like, a really entertaining... Uh, conversational encounter that spawned because it's a mechanical peacock they had no idea if it was threatening or not uh because it's related to the rest of the dungeon in a specific way um so eventually they they decide to act like they're going to leave at the request of the mechanical peacock and then they murder it by shooting it from behind turns out it was not a threat at all and they kill it in one shot and they move further into the dungeon where there's this room of burnt corpses that are walking around pantomiming a boring cocktail party wedding reception. They don't seem to really notice the players other than to say, Oh, do you know the bride? So, um, they're in this room for a little bit trying to figure out what's going on, and uh, I rolled a random encounter that was chameleon women that were, like, stalking them. So... I knew as of like 30 minutes ago that chameleon women had found them and were stalking them, but they were rolling really well on their stealth checks until finally after 30 minutes they failed one and the players saw them. Um, but one of the, the ecosystem-related mandates regarding the chameleon women is that the chameleon women try to stealth and stalk the party until they are engaged in another encounter and then the chameleon women attack, which is... A very scary and threatening thing for players to, or for, for, for monsters to do, especially in an old school game. But once again, like, these behaviors all start working together in ways that are, are more interesting um, because of the ecosystem that wraps the whole thing together. So, um, of course, they, they attacked the chameleon woman when they saw them. They murdered one straight out, just gone. And then, um, 
The two remaining chameleon women demolished four of them, just straight up murdered four of the six players, brought the fifth player down to zero hit points, and the sixth player is the rogue who ran away into another room, stealth reloaded his crossbow, and one shot one of the remaining chameleon women to, uh, to save the day. And that was the end of our play session. <laughs> four of six people dead. And that was, it was awesome. So, yeah, let's talk about ecosystems. So I think this has been installed now. Oh, yes, I do actually want to install it. Uh, previous installation has been detected, so cancel out of that. Yeah, there we go. What system was I running? I was running Lamentations of the Flame Princess. Sathalan with an 11 month resub. Thank you very much for your continued support and welcome back to GM Chat. High five. They got off easy. So let's see, new document. This over here. Hmm. Yes. So I figured we'd just kind of try to create an ecosystem, right? So what I mean by ecosystem isn't. I don't mean what monsters live in the plains, what monsters live in the tundra. That's not what I mean. Mm. Hello, chat. You can see yourself now. There we go. How strange. Yeah, okay. It's a little bit weird because there's no start bar at the bottom. I wonder if I can just like... There we go. Cool. Um, uh, Maze of the Blue Medusa is system neutral, by the way. Um, would I recommend looking at Lamentations of the Flame Princess for hints to improve a 5th edition game as a GM? No. Because they're very different games and they're trying to do very different things. So yes, uh, Weezuel is pointing out, yes, what I mean by an ecosystem is how things interact in a dungeon. So, what do we have? What kinds of um, what kinds of interactions do we have? Oops. We have relationships, right? So we've got relationships that are mutually beneficial. Let's edit label. And I'm not spelling correctly today. Mutually beneficial. Um, we've got relationships that are mutually antagonistic. Oh my gosh, right. I forgot that it does that by default. Mm. So, like, you know, these two things hate each other directly. You know, this person doesn't like that person. This monster wants to eat that monster who also wants to eat this monster. Yes, I mean relationships between monsters, characters, and locations. But the map of all of those relationships taken as a whole is an ecosystem. Especially because think of these things as things that exist with the players in absentia. So it's, it's a steady state that, that is working prior to the players joining. And the players are the new factor in the ecosystem that throw things out of control. Yeah, Brother Shenren says, Judges Guild old school adventure modules have good examples of ecosystems, i.e. caverns of Thracia. Yeah, relationship maps. Mutual beneficial, mutually antagonistic. So like... Um... Let's call this one, actually, I'll just delete that and copy this, copy paste. It's like third party antagonistic or third party beneficial and third party antagonistic. So this is like, we both want to protect this third party. We both want to eliminate this third party, right? Um, 
So, like, this can be thought of as symbiotic. But then we've also got parasitic, right? So parasitic is when one party is leeching off of the other. One-sided beneficial like predator prey. Yeah, so um, predatory. Predator prey relationships. This program is called YED, is areas. So, why? Um, why do we use ecosystem in role playing games? and especially in old school games. And I think the answer is because when we're asking the players to dig into the fiction, when we're asking the players to treat the world as real, having an ecosystem allows layers of meaning that the players can dig through to get more information about what's going on. So if the players could somehow get information from the boy, Tycho, about why he wants them to follow them, then they would know more about what's in the dungeon. They would know that this person has a mother. Um, they, they ran into, they found a, a golden key on the floor of a room that was, had, a, had a string tied to it and it led into another room. And uh, the boy, Tycho, was saying, no, don't go in there. Like he was, he was like, eh, eh, eh. Um, so the the question is why doesn't Tycho want them to go in there? And the answer is because down in that room is um, his dead body reanimated, the white that his body created when his soul was stripped out of it. So he has a relationship to that white, such that if he dies, then the white dies. Um, so that's that's an ecosystem that ties them together. So that's this is like not mutually beneficial or antagonistic, third party beneficial, antagonistic, parasitic, or predator prey. This is like mutually assured destruction. So that's another kind of a relationship that you could put into into your your dungeon. Adri Raja, one more month. Thank you for the 11 months of support. Welcome back to GM Chat. Actually, you know what? I should do this. Add. Oh, three sneaker with the 11 month resub. High five to you as well. Thank you very much. Let's add that there. Whoa. Huge. Put it over here. Fantastic. Yeah. So let's think about this, right? Um, let's try to put some of this into action. Do I think this kind of ecosystem would work on a larger scale, say a province or a kingdom? Yes. Absolutely, I think that it would. Morale. Um, so let's say there's some sort of um, an abandoned castle. You're gonna hear my typing, by the way. And apologies for that. An abandoned castle in the moors taken over by a um like what could it be we've got like some raiding bandits which is kind of boring we've got like some some inland pirates which is also kind of plain um uh taken over by a Let's see, a charismatic young man from a nearby town 
who has been possessed. Whoops. By the spirit of one of the high ranking court nobles who was slain when the castle was sieged 23 years ago. Okay, cool. So, what does that tell us already? Yeah, the, the charismatic young man does claim to be the scion of the old extinct family that once owned the castle because he's possessed by the spirit of one of the people. Xerantos just subscribed for 11 months in a row and asks, Yo, Steven, glad to catch you streaming. Seldom do that over here in Sweden. Yeah, that's why I try to stream a little earlier in the day on the weekend. I like to make sure that I'm available for my EU fans as well. Um, anyways, you going to jam or DM any shows? I don't read Reddit. Sorry for not knowing stuff. Sorry, uh, love your work, so keep it up. Thanks very much, Sarantos. Um, I have stuff in planning. I have nothing ready to announce yet, but I'm very excited to get back to playing. So, yes, we, we have two entities already, the spirit and the man possessed. So that already gives us two pieces to play with. So the spirit... And the man possessed. Perfect. Now these two have a relationship that is parasitic. Actually, let's see. I'm going to take relationships and put them into bubbles. Spirit is parasitic on the man. Um, the man, he probably has a series of, like, folks that he has convinced to join him. So he's got his forces in the castle, right? Um, so... The man's forces. Um, and they're mutually beneficial, certainly. But there's a question as to whether the man's forces are mutually beneficial with the man or with the spirit. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then there's a question. Really beneficial. Whoops. Actually, let's do. Oh my gosh, I hate that setting. I need to undo it. Let's do this. Edit label to add a question mark. Mutually beneficial? Who knows? Maybe some of the man's forces um, are aligned to the man, and some of them are aligned to um, the spirit. I think the man is aware that he's possessed, but he's possessed. And so it's really the spirit speaking through the man when the man speaks. So, there's that. Um, maybe there's another spirit in the castle, right? Maybe there's some sort of, it's like the lover of the spirit, the spirit's lover. So they have a mutually beneficial relationship. Oops, that's not what I want.
Oh my gosh. All I'm trying to do is clean up the organization of this sheet right now. Hmm. There. Ah, lovely, beautiful. Spirit's lover is mutually beneficial with the spirit, um, but probably the spirit's lover is antagonistic to the man. So they're probably antagonistic. So it's like the spirit is parasitic to the man. The man is antagonistic to the spirit. Let's do that. Yes. Oh gosh. Hello, silent mom Cyrus. Blitzkin is in the chat. My mom. Hmm. So the spirit's lover is antagonistic to the man. So this is starting to get complicated, of course. There. Um, the man is probably also antagonistic to the spirit. There we go. Easy. They don't like each other. Is the spirit young enough to have known the man? Um, possibly, maybe so. We can certainly make a note about that. Like, maybe the spirit knew the man as a child. Awesome. Oh, just as awesome as Yin Lad's 11 month resub. Thank you very much, Yin Lad, and welcome back to GM Chat. Harley the Kind says, a type of relationship that can be just as important as an actual existing relationship is the lack of one. Not everything will be related directly, but if you find a multiple step indirect relationship, it could be, it could aid as a clue to the adventure. Yes. So let's say like the spirit is fairly cautious. It found a man, it possessed a man, but the spirit's lover is maybe still looking for someone to possess. So there's a nearby town that is being terrorized by the spirit's lover. So, you know, nearby Hamlet. And this is a mutually antagonistic relationship. Hmm. Yes, the spirit's lover is a spirit. Um, so that's all, that's all of this. Now you can break down the man's forces, like maybe there are some key people there, right? So there's, you know, um, the man's lover. <laughs> so like the man's lover is following him, but she's starting to suspect, or he, she or he is starting to suspect that things are strange. So... Uh, there's the man's lover, the man's loyal friend. Uh, the man's rival, like closest rival, I guess. Oops. Mm-hmm. So these are some folks that we could put in there. And then it's like, okay, the man's closest rival is interested in helping the spirit because if the spirit is controlling the man, then, um, like, the spirit could get rid of the man. Or I guess he's, he's kind of antagonistic to both of them. 
the man's lover maybe is actually sympathetic to the spirit because the spirit has a lover that that they're trying to get like a you know a, a spirit for um the man's loyal friend okay so this is like one ecosystem within this dungeon right What I'm seeing in, in the old school games that I'm reading uh, through is that they don't only include one ecosystem. They include multiple ecosystems that overlap each other. So uh, within this same dungeon, there would be something else going on. So, um, you know, let's, let's take a page out of the maze of the Blue Medusa, right? Maybe, um, so yeah, maybe, maybe there's a seed, the force that sieged the castle originally. So actually, like let's uh let's let's propose that there are there are undead around this castle. Some of them are like the defending forces within the castle, and some of them are the sieging forces from outside of the castle. So then we've got two new forces. Um the sieging force. And the defending force. Yeah, so these two forces are definitely antagonistic. Like, in their undeath, they hate each other. So that's, that's possibly still going on. And now, like, we've got the man's forces. And the man's forces are probably, like... How would they feel about this stuff? Like maybe they would, um, they would ha have an uneasy peace with the defending force because they just sort of leave them alone. But the sieging force, whenever they get into the castle, they're very aggressive and trying to murder everybody in sight. And so, like the man's forces have this uneasy truce with some of the undead, but then. Some of them will try to kill them on sight, and they ha they, it's hard for them to tell which is which, so they're sitting in here in this incredibly tense situation trying to figure out whether anything that comes around the corner is going to kill them or not. Um, let's think, how could we break that down? Um, like, could there be, could there be something about this castle that is, like, keeping these spirits and undead active here? So, okay, all right, uh, I think there's a third, a third ecosystem entity, or a, another entity that we can add into this overarching ecosystem. Let's, let's say the wizard... Thalassia. Um, and what, what has happened here is that the wizard Thalassia has been coming to this castle to perform experiments regularly. Like maybe she's even preparing it for her seclusium, right? So. The wizard Thalassia has been in conversation with the royals to um, repurpose this castle as her seclusium. Not one to wait. She has begun seeding the castle with the wards and uh, power attractors necessary for her work. And so like she has, whoops, whatever, well, we still know. So she's been like um, placing wards and, and magical energy attractors into, into the walls of this castle. So around the castle, there are these things and these things are those which are disturbing the magical forces nearby and causing these spirits and undead bodies 
to to be to be uh, raising themselves out of the ground. Let's just make a quick note so we have it. Thalassia has been preparing the castle for her seclusium, planting wards and arcane energy generators into the walls. These have been awakening the dead. Okay. So then, of course, we could we could have a relationship between her and these wards. Um, arcane energy generators, uh, and these could be these could be like actual. They could be like sigils that are inscribed into the walls or something like that, um, or they could be actual entities. Right? They could be arcane plasms that she's been drawing from the ether and and binding to this plane and to this place you, they could be you know mechanical clockwork devices that you know walk around on set patrols at set times and like spew out um arcane energies right so depending on whether you wanted these things to be mobile and have uh, objectives of their own or whether you wanted them to be static things that the other players in in the ecosystem care about um, is kind of up to you. It's up to your preference and, and what you think is the coolest. So these things are mutually beneficial, certainly. Yes. Um, the defending force benefits from the arcane energy generators because they are returned to life from them but the sieging force could maybe destroy some of these arcane energy generators in order to attack the defending force right so already there's there's another sort of relationship between them the nearby hamlet if they knew about the arcane energy generators and and drew the conclusion that related the arcane energy generators to the spirits then they would want to destroy them so, yeah, uh, so there's a lot that's going on, and now we can just add like a couple weird things that just exist. So I like to go back to um, the thought of acid slimes in the moat. Acid slimes in the moat, and they're just kind of generally hungry. So like the man's forces feed the acid slimes in the moat. So like, let's, let's put this over here. Feed wants to eat. So the man's forces feed the acid slimes in the moat. The acid slimes in the moat want to eat the man's forces. Yep. And then like... And then like... The sieging force is afraid of the acid slimes in the moat. So fears, whoops. The acid slimes in the moat ignore. The sieging force. So, like, the man's forces, the humans, they are regularly threatened by the acid slimes, and they have to sort of keep them at bay by feeding them. But the undead, they can just sort of wade through the acid slime area without, without having any problems. So this becomes a big problem for the players, because it's like, oh, if we're opposed to the humans, we can use these acid slimes to our benefit, but if we are opposed to the undead, then all of a sudden these acid slimes are a serious hazard to us instead. Um, what else could there be? Um, yeah, maybe like these arcane energy generators have, have brought forth some great arcane plasm that's sort of wandering around. The wizard would like to like harness it all of the undead are dead, like dreadful, dreadfully terrified of it. Um, 
it doesn't seem to pay attention to the men. Yeah, like, that's an interesting relationship to add into this mix. The, like, um, otherworldly plasm. So, wants to capture. Was it Thalassia wants to capture the otherworldly plasm? The otherworldly plasm wants to evade Thalassia. Bloop, bloop. Um, the otherworldly plasm ignores the man's forces. Whoops. Uh, the man's forces are probably terrified of the otherworldly plasm. Yes. Um, the otherworldly plasm wants to eat the sieging force and the defending force and also the spirit's lover and also the spirit. <laughs> like, yeah. Again, with the fear. Sieging forest, defending forest, spirit's lover, spirit, and our map is becoming impossible to read. Fear the otherworldly plasm. Yes. So now, now we have some serious allegiances that we can think about and place into the space of our dungeon. So let's draw some boxes around them. So there's the man possessed and his forces, right? Let's lower selection. Yes. Uh, and then the color is going to be like the man's forces will be pink. Yes, because he's human. Um, so I feel like, you know, obviously the, the possessed man and his spirit, they want to keep the plasm away. The plasm is probably like a little disoriented, so it's not acting like under its direct influence. And, and maybe it's not even a corporeal thing, right? And then there's the spirit and the spirit's lover. Like, you know, if, um... If the plasm can just go take what it wants, that's not interesting. What we have to do is um, uh, we have to create an ecosystem that is in stasis when the players arrive. Lower selection, yeah. And this one will be green. Yep, cool. The spirit and the spirit's lover. Sieging force, the defending force, the wizard, the lassia. And the otherworldly plasm. Mm hmm. So. Lower selection. The wizard Thalassia will be purple because she is purple. Okay. The otherworldly plasm. Love it. Let's lower selection. Another oh, only plasm. What color will it be? Um, light blue. Again. Cool. Oh, the wizard Thalassia's influence extends over to there. Let's lower selection. There we go. Cool. And then we've got sieging force and defending force. And sieging force will be. Um, Orange and defending force. Oops. Will be mm -hmm. 
blue. Cool. Acid slimes in the moat. We've got that. Lower selection, and then they'll be green, of course, because acid. Very cool. And then we've got the Hamlet, which is going to be brown. It's not really in the dungeon, but maybe the dun maybe the the Hamlet is actually sending small groups of of villagers in to like see what's happening in there because they're kind of freaked out by everything that's going on. Um, where's a nice brown color? Brown, brown, brown. Whoa. That brown? Can't even tell. Sure. Okay. Bell color too. There. So you can sit here and you can be like, um, what are some random encounters? Random encounters can include sieging force undead, defending force undead, otherworldly plasm, man's forces. Uh, a rogue acid slime, another spirit. Maybe, maybe there's another spirit that's hanging out. Um, a, a an investigating force from the Hamlet, uh, or the wizard Thalassia. Right. So all of a sudden, you've you've exploded the random folks that the players could come into contact with. Um, and like the thing about this chart is that this doesn't even rely on anything in the dungeon, right? Um, so like you could, you could say there's something inherently valuable in the dungeon that someone wants. So maybe there's, maybe there's an art collector in the nearby hamlet and he's willing to pay a lot of money for people who bring back um, like the tapestries from the walls of this, of this castle, you know? Or um, maybe the man's forces, they, they, they're too scared of going into the dungeon because of the defending force that's hanging out down there. Um, and they want people to go down there and bring them back weaponry so that they can like stake their claim. Like they've got their own stuff, but if, if you go down there, you bring back weaponry or alcohol or whatever, that's still good from, from 30 years ago. That's valuable to them, you know? So the man's forces, we can just put like a, Wants weaponry. Yeah. Wants weaponry. And then the nearby hamlet, like, wants tapestries. Yeah. Um, defending force, seizing force, otherworldly plasm, the wizard Thalassia. Hmm. Yeah, maybe the wizard Thalassia wants the players to help her capture the plasm. She promises to give them some riches she found in the treasury or something like that. Yes! So, like, everybody in chat who's, who's tossing out ideas, that's exactly what this is intended to do, right? You, you build this, and, like, I could run this. I could. All I would need to do is build a, a map, and then key all of the rooms, put stuff in them, and then, like, you know... Maybe there's a couple, like a handful of weird arcane things in here. Either creations from the wizard Thalassia, or something that she brought in from somewhere else, or or even like, you know, it, it, it used to be a functional castle. So maybe there was something in the castle, some old, you know, priest set up a, a holy water basin. And then all of a sudden there's this holy water basin that becomes an incredibly valuable resource for the players if they can find it. And if they are antagonistic to the sieging force and defending force, right? Like, you can say, what are the possible solutions for the players when they're, you know, if, if they encounter the plasm, how on earth are they supposed to handle that? And, like, maybe there's some sort of boundary in, in the castle that Thalassia has drawn that the plasm can't get past, right? So let's just make a list of like other things that could be in here. Holy water basin. And that helps players solve the problem of the undead. Um, maybe there's a, a, a ceremonial swords. Ceremonial king swords silvered. 
Ah, very valuable if you're going to be fighting spirits or plasms, right? Um, maybe there are... What do we say? Some sort of uh, uh, anti-plasm boundary. Valuable. Um, there are these tapestries. What does the giant spider want? Maybe there's a giant spider. Totally. You know, it's up in the tower. Um, 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 what was I just going to say? Tapestries. Rich tapestries. Oops. The wards keep the plasm at bay, but Thalassia can't get to it, thus making the players the force that tips that particular balance. Yeah, absolutely. So, I think then what you'd really want to do is you'd want to make sure that this is connected to the nearby, you know, nearby sites. So the nearby hamlet is a great start, but then, like, who is the man and how does he relate? Does he relate to the hamlet? Does he relate to some other section of this game world um maybe what if there is you know um uh, i'm thinking like maybe there was some saint who was interred in the basement of this of this castle right and that becomes an important figure as well so interred saint yeah um maybe he was sealed into the walls there's a secret room containing the saint's body, and there's treasure in there. Yeah. So, I hope this has been interesting. I know that, like, you know, this is the most informal of our informal RPG chats so far. It's not like I have something concrete to teach here, but I, I'm enjoying exploring this concept with you all. And um, and uh, I hope that you're all enjoying exploring this concept with me as well. Um, so on the subject of of ecosystems in a Dungeons and Dragons game, in a Dungeons and Dragons um, adventure, what are your questions? Do you have any questions about this? Um, yeah, to toss them in chat. Let's do a little Q and A for maybe ten minutes or fifteen minutes or so. And then we'll switch over and we'll play some braid for a bit. And a cavalry says, observing the process is great. Good. I'm glad. Currently, I'm running Maze of the Blue Medusa in Lamentations of the Flame Princess, which is an old school retro clone. Can't wait to see theory become practice. When, Steven? I don't know, Kaiser Prime. I can't announce it yet. I'm, I'm really looking forward to when we can turn the theory into practice. What are some ways the players can change the ecosystem to their benefit? So that depends on their goals, right? Like, um, so really in, in an old school game, what the players are looking for is treasure. So maybe maybe this defending force of undead are the primary defenders of treasure. Yeah, the players aren't on here. Um, yeah, that's that's an excellent one. So like really, this is it's a it's a situation that the players can blunder into and make allies or enemies um, as they as they see fit. So the, let's argue the the defending force are the ones that are hiding away the bulk of the treasure. So. Immediately, as soon as the players realize that, like, the men are kind of wary of the defending force, but not outright hostile to them, and the sieging force is outright hostile to the defending force, but the sieging force is largely kept at bay by the acid slimes in the moat, but the men don't like the sieging force, like, all of a sudden, <laughs> there's, there's this huge complex web of things that if the players learn, the players can then deal with in interesting ways. So, like... The acid slimes in the moat want to eat the men. The men are afraid of the sieging force. If we can get the sieging force into the castle, like, sieging force and acid slimes are, the acid slimes are sort of a barrier. Um, 
So if we can move the acid slimes into the castle to eat the men, then the sieging force can come into the castle because we don't have to worry about the men freaking out about the sieging force anymore. The sieging force can attack the defending force. In the ensuing chaos, the players can slip past the defending force and grab a whole bunch of loot and get out. All you have to do is murder the men in there at the hands of the acid slimes and the sieging force, and then you're basically done. Um, except that, like, what about these spirits? How do they fit into things? Maybe they have wants and needs. Like, maybe as soon as you get into the castle, like, the first thing that you encounter is the spirit's lover. And so, if, if like, how the players fit into this, depends on the physical space that you build and how you key it. So if, you know, the drawbridge is up and you can't get across the acid moat, but there's a small porthole on the western wall, and that's where the player climbs into, and the first thing in there is the spirit's lover, then that's how the players first engage with the dungeon um, and how they, how they first start learning about what's in there. I like that question because it's a really fun uh it's a really fun question. What are some ways the players can change the ecosystem to their benefit? Um Sionoyas says how to keep track of all that during play? Do you use only random encounters? No way. So for an old school module if this were an old school module, let's argue that it is. Um, when you when you build the space, you want to know what the space is. So you have the you have the map that has all the rooms drawn on it, and you you key each room and you say what's in each room, including any traps, any treasures, any uh, locked doors, um, any doors that require a special event to be able to open. Um, so you key all of that, and then you have a chart or, or some sort of list of the actors in the dungeon and how, what they want and how they feel about the other parts of the dungeon. So this is pretty easy. Acid slimes want to eat the men. The men, like, let's say the man's closest rival is the one feeding the acid slimes every day. Like, yeah. Um, so you'd, you'd have that list, and then you could, you could do things like you could implement countdowns, and I, I think countdowns are a really, really, really excellent tool from Apocalypse World and Dungeon World um, and Powered by the Apocalypse games, and I think that the old school, old school games need to adopt them, basically, because they're doing them anyway. Like, um, uh, there's basically a section of the Maze of the Blue Medusa that's just a big countdown, and it's like... As the players engage with this dungeon, this countdown starts advancing. So, um, so for example, let's say that these arcane energy generators, like they they summoned this plasm through, but they're also keeping the plasm like, um, sort of, they're keeping his energy distorted. So, if you go through and you start shutting down arcane energy generators then that's a countdown that starts affecting both the sieging and defending forces. They get weaker, but the plasm gets stronger. And so, like, every time, uh, like, when the players are moving around in here, if those arcane energy generators are shutting down, um, the, the relative power structures in the dungeon are changing, and encounters are going to play out differently depending on how the players encounter them at, at what state of that countdown is. How would I deal with a sudden player character's death? Asks Arist Effects. So, I have just had to deal with that. Um, in old school gaming, like, your players are gonna die. Or your characters are gonna die. Um, so what I did is I had, uh, I had Humphrey Bostock hire the six player characters plus four other adventurers to protect his house. And so now that four of them have died, it worked out perfectly. Four of the player characters died, and they all just rolled randomly to determine which of the other four adventurers they were going to play next time. You could look at food and water sources as well, SJC Theo says. Yes, uh, that's something that we haven't put on here. We don't know where the men are getting their supplies from. We don't know necessarily who the sieging and defending forces are eating if they need to. What the otherworldly plasm consumes. Yes. 
yeah, so like what I've done is I have seeded this starting adventure with uh, backup characters because I knew that players would die. Um, another thing you can do is encourage your players to bring hirelings and then let them play hirelings. You could say there's a couple of people who came from the nearby hamlet who, who were like investigating this, uh, this castle and what's been going on, and they are adventurers. Yeah, all of the players roll a backup PC before the first session. Yep, all of those things. Absolutely. Cowboy Bebopper is asking, in regards to the ecosystem, how could the players interact with the environment rather than the organisms which inhabit it? As in, if the players affect the environment, would or how would that affect the ecosystem? Well, certainly. Like, you know, the man's forces, they need food, water, shelter. So, you know, if the players had some way of collapsing a wall in the main hall that the men's forces were camping in, then that would no longer be a, a good camp for them, and they would have to move somewhere else. So maybe moving them from that location helps helps the players in some way. Um, or um, who's, who was saying it? SJC Theo says, uh, you could look at food and water sources. Certain monsters may only like certain environments. If you turn the moat basic, then the acid slimes can't inhabit it anymore, and they get forced out. Do they leave, or do they, you know, slime underground, or, you know, down into the dungeon, maybe? Or do they, like, slime up into the castle and start rampaging through it? Um, significant environmental factors is a thing that you could add to the ecosystem model, which is something fake Alex Blue just said in chat. Um, and it's absolutely true. So if you have, uh, if you know the way a big event or a big possible event is maintaining the status quo, and if the event happens, then the status quo will change. You can stick that on your um, relationship map. So here's the thing, Squeegee44. Squeegee44 is asking, um, is the ecosystem there to help the DM plan or to add depth to the world? I find the more complicated things become, the less likely players are to piece things together, so it doesn't have a great impact on their experience. So. All of this is in relation to old school gaming, and one of the, the fundamental ways that players can guarantee their survival or give themselves the highest possibility of survival is by thoroughly engaging with the game world in a non-combat way. So trying to figure out the relationships between factions, which factions will benefit the players the most if they ally with them, what their actions in the environment are likely to do um, all of these pieces of information are critical for allowing the players to get in as uh, inobtrusively as possible, get what they need, and get out. Um, so one, old school gaming kind of, uh, it creates space that requires players to investigate deeply like this. Um, and two, like, I know all of this stuff, and it helps me, and it helps me make the game respond to what the players are doing, which is, that's, that's the critical thing that this helps me do. If the players engage with this ecosystem, I know how it responds. But, um, I don't need to be miserly with information about the ecosystem, right? I, I can actually be free and give a lot of this information out readily. I don't need to worry uh, about holding it all. In fact, I shouldn't. I should, I should have these NPCs, especially like the initial NPCs that the players meet, should be very willing to sort of generally describe what's going on in the castle. Yeah, so Cowboy Bebopper says, in response to Fake Alex Blue, Fake Alex Blue said, maybe significant environmental factors could be added to the ecosystem model. And Cowboy Bebopper said in response, that's what I was thinking, but I'm not sure if Steven is using this to establish relationships over game world. So I don't, that's, that's a false dichotomy, Cowboy Bebopper, because important relationships to the game world are still relationships. And I think all of that is valuable to include. If, if there's a factor of this, um, if there's a factor that contributes to the current situation, we should probably include it. So for example, we can imagine that these arcane energy generators, they are like, 
ancient um important sites within the castle so like the throne or the headsman's block or things like that those those parts are the they are the arcane energy generators so they're physical spaces in the game world but um they're still on the map yeah so I think that that's going to do it for today's informal RPG chat. Um, I'm going to take a, like, a three-minute break, have a little bio plan, and... Um, bio plan. A little bio break, and then we'll come back and we'll play some Braid. By Design 01 says... Uh, as a GM, you should do the amount of world building that uh, he, him or herself feels comfortable with. I think if an ecosystem is needed, then do it. If not, don't. Um, so I half agree with you. Do, what, do what's valuable to you at your table for your game. But, but for old school games, you need this information. As a GM, you need it. You need to know what's going to happen in your dungeon when the players enter. You need to create an ecosystem that has weak points that the players can figure out and exploit because if they try to just fight stuff, they're just going to die. Like um this isn't necessary for every game. It's definitely way too much prep for Dungeon World, for Apocalypse World. It's way too much prep uh, it's probably too much prep for 5th edition because all the players are going to do is go in, fight an encounter, move to the next room, fight another encounter. But in an old school game where 80% of the stuff on, the, on this chart can kill them outright, they should not be just running in and fighting. And so having the relationships between things, that's what the players engage with in order to give themselves the advantage they need to get what they want and survive. You need it for an old school game. Ah, well, this was a lot of fun. I hope that you guys had a good time with it. And I will be back in five minutes. We'll do a little, another hour worth of chill stream. We'll play some Braid, hang out. I hope you'll stick around and I will see you very soon. So, cheers, y'all. <laughs>